the recording. Um, that's all looking all right. And if we put the slides up. So hopefully you can now all see the title slide for today's lecture. Um, we're going to carry on considering metal forming. So we've got two lectures this week uh, and that will complete the metal forming part of the course. We're going to spend two lectures looking at deep drawing. Um, that's today and then tomorrow at 4 p.m. Um, I'm going to introduce deep drawing to you today and then uh, Dr Anastasia Vasilio, whom I think you have met in the tutorials, is going to be delivering the second uh, deep drawing lecture tomorrow. Um, uh, in common with previous weeks, we're going to have a question and answer session. Uh, this week's is on Wednesday at 6 p.m. and you were all sent the Zoom link by email. So if at the end of the question or after the question and answer session today or tomorrow, you've still got burning questions on any part of the forming course, then drop into the drop in session between six and seven on Wednesday evening. Um, I don't think there's any other noticey type things to do. So without any more ado, we'll move on. Uh, we're going to be considering deep drawing today. And if you remember last week, lecture 18, we were still looking at extrusion and we were doing some simple mathematics to allow us to analyze the load required to perform an extrusion. Um, and we then took those on to look at something called Johnson's equation for extrusion, where he modified the simple extrusion equations based upon experiment to take account of friction and redundant work. Our simple estimates were underestimates of the punch load, and Johnson allows us to make a more accurate estimate of the punch load for extrusion. We also spent a little bit of time looking at extrusion defects, such as piping, fir tree cracking and rear cavity defects. So today's lecture is going to start off with an overview of the deep drawing process, uh, looking at the sort of tooling, that, what it does, the sort of tooling we use and typical products. Um, there are no videos because you would have seen a deep drawing video already in lecture one and you can go back and look at that one afterwards if you want to. Um, we're going to have a look at the process of deformation uh, that occurs when you draw a flat disc into a cup, a typical deep drawing operation and the sort of punch load variation that we might expect to see because of that. And then we're going to start to introduce the deep drawing distortion parameters, the ones that we we'll use for simple calculations, uh, similar to the, they're very similar to the ones that we derived and used for extrusion. Uh, and in this case, we're going to put together a couple of simple parameters to measure the intensity of a deep drawing operation. Um, and those parameters will be taken on and used in tomorrow's lecture to do some calculations. Um, then we're going to start looking at defects. We're going to step back from calculations today and we're going to look at the sort of things that can go wrong in deep drawing. Um, so deep drawing itself as a process, what you do is you take a piece of sheet metal and you stretch it into its final part shape. So it's not like extrusion, which takes a lump, a billet, and it's not like forging, which tends to take a lump or a billet. It takes a piece of sheet metal and changes its shape into a thin walled part. Uh, so you start off by cutting your raw rolled sheet material into a set of predetermined shapes, which we call blanks. And the, that shape will depend upon the form of the component that you're proposing to make and the shape of the die that you're putting it in. Um, the drawing process itself uses specially designed tools um, and they're generally called dies, punches and blank holders to allow us to form the blank, which is flat, 
into a three-dimensional shape, like a beer can, for instance. That's a classic deep drawn uh, metal component. Now, deep drawing mostly generates tensile stresses in the blank during forming. In other words, you're stretching it. Um, and that's in contrast to extrusion, which we were looking at last week, because that tends to generate compressive stresses. So straight away, the processes are different. Now, it's much easiest to deep draw if your metal is very ductile. In other words, it can take an awful lot of strain before it fails. <coughs> um, and aluminium, brass, copper and mild steel are typical metals that we can deep draw. So a drinks can uh, will often be either aluminium or mild steel. And um, the relative economics of using those two materials um, uh, vary from time to time. Um, now, deep drawing tooling is expensive to design and develop, uh, and you'll see that it has to have quite high tight tolerances. It's made of very strong materials. And because of that, you don't use deep drawing to make one off parts. It's not like a blacksmith forge where you can make pretty well any shape part you like. It's best suited to making lots and lots of identical products. Again, like drink scans, um, because you pay for your very expensive tooling and your press, and then you use it again and again and again. And there's the, the, the starting point material for deep drawing. It's cold rolled sheet. So just like many forming processes, you're taking as the input for this forming process, the output of another forming process, in this case, cold rolling, which we talked about briefly in lecture one. So what do we make using deep drawing? Well, here's a typical deep drawn product. That's a stainless steel sink, which I'm sure you will have all have seen before. That's a relic that's quite thin stainless steel sheet and that's been drawn into a shape with a drainer uh, and with two sinks and the basic shape that the drain is going to uh, fit into. Now, obviously, the, the bits that go into the drain are not part of that single deep or multiple deep drawing operation. That will have been made from a non-circular blank, as you can imagine. And here's another one at Drinks Can, lots and lots of them. So in this case, the bottom parts of these are all deep drawn. You can see that the top is actually a separate piece of metal that's attached to a later manufacturing process. And that's quite possibly been stamped or deep drawn itself. Um, but you can see that the, the component you're making is actually very thin walled, very deep and cylindrical. And that would have started from a flat round piece of sheet. And here's an oil pan. Um, and here is the back panel for a washing machine. Again, that's probably stainless steel. Um, and that will have been deep drawn from a non-circular blank. So that's the sort of things you can make using deep drawing. Um, now for that, you require tooling. And the basic tooling that you need has got three components. So what we're making here is a very simple cylindrical cup. Uh, we are squashing a blank with a punch, which is the gray component. And that blank is put on top of a die, which is forming part of its final shape. You can see that the final shape is defined by the gap between the punch and the die. And that blank is held by something called a blank holder. So you've got two forces on there. There's the force holding the blank holder. Uh, and then there's the force you use to push the punch down. So the die and the punch tend to be made of hardened steel because you want them to have a very high yield strength. Uh, you want them not to wear um, during the multiple drawing operations, because if they wear, their accuracy is degraded and the thickness and surface finish of your drawn component is also degraded. The punch applies pressure to the sheet blank and it pushes it into the die, pushes it downwards into the die to achieve the desired shape. Now, what that means is that actually 
the sheet material of the blank is on average flowing inwards towards the die. Because what you don't do is merely squash the bit of the sheet that was underneath the punch when you started. As that punch goes down, it's drawing material in uh, from the blank. So the diameter of the blank is steadily shrinking as material is drawn into the die by the punch. So you've got radial motion of the material as the component is gradually formed. So the blank holder is there to hold the, the, um, the blank flat uh, as it moves into the die. You don't want it wrinkling or anything like that. You need to keep it flat and smooth. And so you push down hard on it as it goes into the die. And now obviously if you push too hard, you'll have too much friction, which you don't want. Um, but you do need enough of a blank holding force to keep the thing flat as it slides in. So that's basic tooling setup. You've got a die, a blank holder and a punch. And the blank fits between the die and the punch, uh, blank holder. And the punch pushes the blank downwards into the die. And the shape of the final component is defined by the shape of the end of the punch and the walls of the die and the side of the punch, which you can see from that diagram. Now the flat part, this is something I haven't said, when you finished the drawing operation, if you've got any of it left flat at the top, any of the blank left flat at the top, as you can see in that picture, you call that the flange. Sometimes you draw with a flange and sometimes you don't. So here's the deep drawing sequence for a simple cylindrical cup. So it's the same setup we had on the previous slide. You start out with that nice round blank in the bottom left. You put it on top of the die, which is green. You clamp it with the blank holder, which is blue, and down comes the punch and it gradually pushes it down into the die. And in this case, you can see we pushed the whole of the blank down into the die. And we've ended up with a completed drawn part, which in this case is a simple cylindrical cup. So all the material has flowed radially in between the blank holder and the die and then down between the punch and the die. And you've ended up with that nice little cylindrical component. OK, now we do have nomenclature and it's uh, similar to what we saw before. We've got a circular blank on the left and on the drawn cup on the right. The bit that's vertical we call the wall. And then the bit which curves between the wall and the flat at the bottom uh, is called the profile. Um, well, it's actually a radius. It's called the profile radius, the edge radius or the corner radius. You'll see different things in different textbooks. So you can see you've got a vertical wall. You've got a bit that curves around the corner and then you've got a flat bottom to the cup. And of course, that flat bottom is defined by the flat end of the punch. OK, so let's think about how the metal flows, because that will actually help us to think about what might go wrong in the future. You start off with a round blank and you've got a round die cavity. And those green arrows show the way how the, the blank as a whole, the material of the blank flows inwards and then down into the die cavity. So you've got radial flow inwards and down into the die cavity. As the punch pushes the center of the blank into the die, everything's drawn radially inwards, which is why we call it drawing. And in this case, we call it deep drawing because we're making quite deep components. Um, no difficulties there. That's just saying we're making something quite deep. So we want it to flow down quite a long way, like the drinks can we saw earlier. So how does it deform? Again, we'll stick with that simple cylindrical cup that we saw. Uh, it's pretty well the easiest deep drawing operation you can do. Make a cylindrical cup from a flat circular blank of material. 
So it's nothing complicated like a stainless steel double sink unit or a washing machine back panel or even a drinks can because that drinks can is actually quite complicated. It's just a simple cup. So here we have another diagram of what's going on. The die, the blank holder, which in this picture is called a hold down ring and the punch. And you can see that the blank is held between the hold down ring or blank holder and the die and down comes the punch. Very simple operation, but of course, rather complex deformation. So we can divide it into zones. We can divide our blank into three zones, depending on what happens to it. And here they are, and there you can see their annular zones. So we've got the outermost zone X, an intermediate zone Y, and then a central zone Z. So Z is just circular and X and Y are effectively rings. So the outer annular zone X is material that's in contact with the die. So you can see you're starting out with the uh, blank clamped down onto the die and that zone X, that's in contact with the die when you start. The inner annular zone is initially not in contact with either the punch or the die because they've got radii on them because we're going to form a radius eventually at the bottom, otherwise it'll break. Um, and because they've got radii, you've got a region, an annular region, which is initially not in contact with the die because the die is falling away with a radius and not in contact with the punch because the punch has also got a radius at the end. So that's like a sort of floating zone. And then finally, you've got the circular zone Z, which starts off in contact with the flat end of the punch. So those are our three zones. So what we're going to do now is think about what happens in those zones. So the way it works is the first thing you get is pure radial drawing between the die and the blank holder. So the material in zone X is being pulled in radially towards the die. So we've generated a radial tensile stress because the material has already gone down into the die is pulling on it. Um, that radial tensile stress is pulling the material in. So it's tensile stress in the radial direction. Now, because the radius is progressively decreasing, that means if you take an increment of that material, we can call it delta R, or we can call it one millimetre in the radial direction. If you pull that one millimetre block of material in a bit, then because the diameter of the blank is smaller at a smaller radius, and because plastic deformation has to take a place at constant volume, then actually that will start to thicken. Because it's being pushed in, in the circumferential direction, because the materials following radial lines that gradually get closer together, because it's being pushed in, uh, which is a circumferential compression, the only place it can expand is up. So it actually slowly gets thicker. So it's pushing up against the blank holder pressure, but it has to expand in some direction because each increment of material that you're pulling in has to keep its volume pretty well constant, our classic plastic deformation assumption. So it's gradually getting thicker as it's moving in. And then, of course, once you've got the gap there, you can just stretch it. And then, of course, you can bend it over the die profile because it's being pushed down and bending round over that very rigid die. And of course, it will also slide over that die profile because you're pulling material down into the cup. So it's got to go round the edge and down into the cup. Otherwise, you won't end up with those tall walls at the end. And the same thing happens in the punch profile radius on the outside of the punch just here. You've also got bending and sliding. And then finally, uh, underneath the punch, it's just stretching. It's stretching radially, which means it 
must be getting thinner in the other direction. Um, and it's stretching and sliding because material on average is flowing out from the edge of the punch and up into the walls. So what else are we going to say about this? When you start in zone X, various parts of that can go through some or all of the processes we talked about on the previous slide. And if you remember, those were pure radial drawing, stretching, and then bending and sliding, depending on how far they get. If you end up with a big flange left on your die, on your blank, sorry, your formed cup, then you'll have material that's only been pulled in radially. If you pull all the material down into the annulus between the punch and the die, then it will have done all of processes one, two and three. It would have started out with pure drawing, then it would have stretched as it came out of the end of the interface between the um, die and the blank holder. And then it will bend and slide over the die profile as it goes down. Zone Y, which is the stuff that starts uh, between the clamps area and the area under the end of the punch, undergoes processes two, three and four. So if you go back and look at them, starts out by stretching. It doesn't do radial drawing because it doesn't start between the blank holder and the die. Um, sorry, if I use my mouse, you can see where I'm pointing. If I use my hand, you can't see where I'm pointing at all. Um, it doesn't do that initial radial drawing because it starts out here. So it starts out by stretching. Then, of course, it uh, stretch, it bends and slides over the die. And this area, of course, can also end up being pushed around the edge of the punch as well. So bending and sliding over the punch. OK. Where zone Z, which starts out here, undergoes processes three, four and five. And if you go back and see what's going on, it's because that material starts out by stretching and sliding over the punch head. Then it goes up here. Um, and it also slides on the die. So that some of that material ends up in the gap between the punch and the die. So quite complicated, but if you think about it in terms of how the metal's flowing, what's getting in its way, so like the radial drawing where it's coming in and the material's getting, these material elements getting closer, and so you'll end up with a circumferential compression and a thickening. Think through how it goes round and those do make sense. Now, the upshot of that is actually, you tend not to get a uniform wall thickness in your final cup. Now, of course, what you'd like is a completely uniform wall thickness in your cup, absolutely everywhere, because that means you wasted no material, uh, having it thicker than it needs to be. You've not got regions that have thinned down and potentially are gonna suffer failure. Uh, so it, it, you know, this is your ideal drawn cup is a constant thickness cup. And of course it isn't, sadly. There's a very exaggerated final cup profile in this rather fuzzy picture on the left. So the final cup profile you can see is round the edge of the punch. And then you've got this shape here, which starts thicker at the top, gets thinner as it goes down, does some strange things as it goes round that radius and ends up with a relatively constant thickness in front of the or below the punch itself. Um, if you looked at the initial blank profile and just bent it round the edge, you'd see something like this. So that's a constant thickness cup. And of course, what you've ended up with in exaggerated terms is this thing. Um, and obviously, you don't really want that. Um, it's due to the complex deformation process that took place because you're drawing, which is making it thicker, then you're bending it, and then you're stretching it, which tends to make it thinner. Um, and you're doing this at different locations at different times. And when you stop, different bits of material in that final cup 
have followed different deformation histories. So it's sort of unavoidable. So the top edge of the cups always thickened because of those compressive hoop stresses when it was drawn in. And it hasn't had time to stretch dramatically as it goes down the um, between the die and the punch. The thinning that you see occurs mainly in the wall because that's material that's been deformed the most. It's come out round the bottom of the punch and gone up or it's come in and down uh, from the flange. And if you get enough tensile deformation, you can form a neck just like a tensile test, which means you can get local thinning. Or in the worst analysis, the whole thing can tear and you get a cup with the end punched out of it. So the overall effect of all of that is that the cup that you produce uh, actually is taller than if no, there'd be no thickness change, if you manage to do the whole thing at constant thickness. Um, so that's what tends to happen. And as you might expect, because it's a quite a complex deformation process, it's also a complex loading process. Um, now, the punch force versus punch stroke response during deep drawing is approximately sinusoidal. I'm not going to attempt to explain that, and you don't need to explain that, but that's broadly speaking what you get. You get a sinusoidal deformation. Um, however, it is significantly affected by how much clearance, how much radial clearance there is between the punch and the die. In other words, if there's going to be a gap at the end of it all when you've drawn your cup, because your cup is actually thinner than the gap between the die and the punch, you can see you get a very simple sinusoidal load. Um, because the material causes, because the drawing process causes the material to thicken as it comes in towards the punch and then goes down, you can end up with it coming in thicker than the gap between the die and the punch in the vertical direction. So you then get a secondary rise in load. And so you can see if you've got a 10% radial clearance, that uh, rise in load occurs quite late. If there's no radial clearance, it's exact fit, it occurs very uh, you know, earlier. If you've actually deliberately got a negative clearance, in other words, there isn't quite enough space to fit all the material in at the, the thickness that you would originally have started with, you end up with somewhat higher loads. Um, and basically what this does is because you've now got interference between the die, the punch, and the um, material that's flowing down, you're squashing it in the radial direction. You're actually thinning it down again, and they call it ironing, which is a, you know, you're flattening it. Uh, it's called ironing, and sometimes people deliberately do this. They deliberately do this, in order to produce a more uniform wall thickness. Now it increases the punch loads, uh, which is a, a, a negative, but it can end up with a more uniform product. Um, so people do sometimes deliberately do this uh, because you can then ensure that your cup is closer to uniform thickness than it would be if you allowed a clearance between the final cup the die and the punch, and therefore had a lower punch load, that might actually not be your most desirable outcome. Okay, so that's deep drawing. Now, of course, if you're going to do a simple calculation, you need some parameters, just as we had in extrusion, we need some parameters to estimate how severe the operation is. So these are related to the amount of deformation you have to put in. The first parameter we use is something called the draw ratio. So if you draw a cylindrical cup, then the draw ratio is very simple, D0 over D. 
So obviously you need to know what D0 and D are. And D0 is the original diameter of your little circular blank. And D is the diameter of the punch. So these are two things that you know. Now, some publications define D as the diameter of the die, which is, of course, is slightly larger than the diameter of the punch because you've got to fit material down there to form the final cup. And sometimes in an estimate, it's just easier to use the mid wall diameter of the cup that you produce, which is the average of the diameters of the punch and the die. But basically, it's punch diameter, sorry, it's blank diameter divided by punch diameter. So as the punch gets smaller, which means you're going to make a taller cup with a higher, um, higher walls, as the punch gets smaller, the draw ratio goes up. So a small punch and a large blank means you're going to be doing a lot of drawing. You're going to go a long way down, produce a tall cup. That's a large draw ratio. D0 and D, because D0 is always bigger than D, otherwise you wouldn't be drawing at all. Um, so the draw ratio is always greater than one, and the bigger it is, the deeper you are drawing. Okay, that's the draw ratio. There's also a parameter called reduction. And of course you had a reduction in um, extrusion as well, but the deep drawing reduction is defined, it's got the name R, and it's again defined using the blank diameter and the punch diameter. It's D0 minus D over D0. So you subtract the punch diameter, sorry, yes, you subtract the punch diameter from the blank diameter and divide it by the um, original blank diameter. So you can see that in that case, it's always less than one, the reduction. Um, okay. There's some more manipulation on this slide, basically to show that there's a relationship between the draw ratio and the reduction. And that's not surprising because they're defined using the same quantities. So you can see if you go through the algebra on that slide, the draw ratio is one over one minus R. So the bigger R, the bigger the draw ratio. So they're going in the same direction. So those are our two parameters. Um, we'll need to remember those for tomorrow because they'll be used in the calculations on deep drawing, but they're just simple definitions and they're there to have a measure of how severe the deformation that you're putting in is. OK, now, just like in extrusion, uh, we can actually make some little calculations about what the relationship is between different parameters and different dimensions in a deep drawing operation. So if we start off with a cup of a mid wall diameter D, so we're using the mid wall diameter rather than the punch diameter or the die diameter. So that's about the average of the two there. We've got a mid wall diameter D. We've got a vertical height from the base to the top of H, and that's what we want to make. So what diameter do we need the blank to be? And here's a little diagram showing you. We've got a height H, a mid wall diameter D, and a thickness T. And we're going to assume that thickness is uniform for a simple calculation. Now, of course, you and I know that it's not, but for a simple calculation, this is what we'll go with. Let's assume there's no change in volume. Now that's a pretty good assumption because this is plastic deformation and plastic deformation occurs at constant volume. So it's exactly the same sort of assumption we made during extrusion. Um, we're also going to say, in, in reality, we have an edge radius or a profile radius. In other words, the, uh, the real cup has a radius here. 
okay? So its shape isn't just a cylinder on top of a disc. It's a little bit more complicated, but we're going to ignore that because it's a second order effect. So approximately, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to work out the volume of the blank and the volume of the cup. So the volume of the blank is D0, the blank diameter squared, and it's D0 over 2 squared times pi times its thickness, T0. So that's just the thickness of a cylindrical blank. It's the area of the circle times the wall, times the height. So that's easy. And then if we look at the cup, what we find is we've got a bit down at the bottom, which is a circular disc, which has volume d squared, d over 2 squared times pi times t, because that's the final wall thickness. And then we have the cup. And that has a volume pi d, which is the perimeter, times the thickness, times the height. So d, if you remember, is the average diameter, the mid wall diameter of that wall. So all we've worked out is the volume of that hollow cylinder, pi d h t. And we know that the volume of the blank equals the volume of the final part because we've not thrown any material away. It's all still there. Now, if we further assume, which is let's 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 make things really simple. Let's assume there's no change in thickness. We've managed to draw this component without changing its thickness. So we've been done some very, very, very clever ironing and we've been very, very clever in our tool design. Then we can actually reduce this because we can chuck all the pies away and we can chuck all the t's away on both sides. So what we're left with is d naught over two squared equals d over two squared plus d h. Um, that's a very simple calculation and it's usually not correct, but you can use it for first order work. Basically, we're saying let's not change the volume and we can do a very simple calculation. Okay, that's a volume calculation. Um, we're now not going to do any more math for the remainder of the lecture. Um, we're just going to have a look at some of the things that can go wrong during or initial look at a few things that can go wrong in deep drawing. So the first one is something called ears. This is a cup. We've tried to draw our cylindrical cup here. And oh dear, it's not got it, uh, a nice flat top. It's got a wavy surface at the top. And you can see we call those waves ears because they actually usually take the same characteristics. So this very often happens when you finish drawing, you've got these lobes or ears at the rim of the drawn part. So what we've done here is we pulled the whole of the blank in uh, to make a, a component with no flange. And we've got these ears at the top. Um, typically, you form four ears around the periphery and you can just about see in that photograph that it does indeed have four ears, although they're not quite the same height. So what's going on? Well, it all comes down to what we make our drawn part out of. We usually use cold rolled sheet because that's thin and it has a good surface finish. And that's what we want. Um, and if you remember back to lecture one, when you roll sheet material, you start out with a billet and you roll it through the rolls. And each time you roll it through the rolls, it gets long. Vertically and longer in the direction it's rolled. And this often happens um, many, many times in rolling. And when you do that in cold rolling, the grain structure eventually becomes very strongly aligned with the rolling direction. You elongate the grains as well. They might start out equiaxed, which is roughly the same in each. They don't end up like that. And if you've aligned the grain structure 
you pointed all the grains in the same direction and aligned them, that means their crystallographic orientations are all very similar. And suddenly, you cannot assume that its properties are the same in every direction anymore. And you may have done this in materials. Um, basically, the mechanical properties start becoming directional. Its stiffness and its yield strength and its flow properties, its hardening modulus, become different in different directions. In particular, the, the uh, numbers parallel to the rolling direction and perpendicular to the rolling direction are very different. For thin sheet, we don't worry about the through wall because that doesn't affect things very much when you draw it. It's the fact that parallel and perpendicular to the rolling direction are different. We say it's anisotropic. It doesn't behave the same if you pull it across the sheet as if you pull it along the sheet. Now, in deep drawing, we're trying to do an axisymmetric operation. So in other words, you're very, you know, all the way around the blank, you're following radial lines in, and the whole thing looks like a solid of revolution all the time. If you look at any section all the way around it, any radial section, it will be behaving the same, we hope. The loads on it will be the same because of the depth, because of the way we're loading it, which is fine. But unfortunately, uh, the deformation response is a function of both the loads and the mechanical properties. So because the material is anisotropic, because its stress strain response is different in the rolling direction and across the rolling direction, that means the strains become non axisymmetric and suddenly you start getting non axisymmetric deformation and you end up with these ears um, and you get four ears. Um, you don't need to be able to explain why. Um, it's probably possible to work it out from first principles if you think about what the stress strain behavior is parallel and perpendicular to the rolling direction. But this is down to anisotropy, and that's what you need to know. Now, you can stop this if you put a heat treatment in before you draw the sheet. So you take your sheet and you anneal it. In other words, you heat it up to a very high temperature above which the grains recrystallize. Uh, so new grains nucleate and form on the boundaries of the old grains. Um, and what, what you're doing is you are forming new grains with no dislocation buildups in them because you, there's no hardening. And the energy that you basically this become, this is an energetically favorable thing to do. So as long as you've got it hot enough, that you've got enough thermal activation, it can rearrange itself into a lower energy state by recrystallizing. And what you end up with a fine grain structure, which is uniform in every direction. So you end up with a non-aligned grain structure. So if you anneal a piece of sheet, and you would have to do that in a vacuum furnace because otherwise you'd oxidize the surface, which you wouldn't want. Um, you can restore your non-aligned grain structure. And that means when you draw it, you won't get problems with anisotropic material behavior. Now you'll find out tomorrow, it's quite common to do annealing during a drawing operation or multiple drawing operations because that allows you to reset the hardening of the material so you can continue to stretch it without it necking. But that's for tomorrow's lecture. But for today, what we need to know is that if you don't like the effects of your cold rolled sheet being anisotropic, you can put in a further treatment stage between cold rolling and deep drawing where you change its properties by annealing it to make its mechanical properties isotropic again, which is what you want when you deep draw it. Now, you may not need to do that. If you're, if you're making a flanged part and you're quite happy to cut the flange off afterwards, then may well be, it may well be you can get away without an annealing operation because you can basically design your drawing to fit in with the anisotropy of the 
um, material so that the lobes remain in the flange and you can just cut them off afterwards. But obviously, if you're not generating a flange, you're actually pulling all the material down into the die, then you've either got to remove the lobes by changing the material beforehand so it doesn't form them, or you've got to accept that there's a post drawing operation where you cut the lobes off. So again, it's a production engineering issue. How many steps do you want to make the component that you actually need and what should those steps be? Okay, so that's directionality. And as I said in this final bullet point, if you don't want to go through the faff of um, putting in an annealing operation, then you can actually make a component with ears and cut them off afterwards. You will waste material, but that might be your best option. So what else can go wrong with deep drawing? Well, I'll show you a couple more. Here's wrinkling. Um, uh, and this happens because, do you remember you get compressive hoop stresses, compressive circumferential stresses in the flat part of the blank because you're pulling in it radially and it's all getting in each, each element is getting in the adjacent elements way as the circumference falls. So you get compressive hoop stresses. Whenever you have compressive stress, you can have buckling, particularly in thin components. And this is an example of buckling. Um, and it's buckled between the blank holder and the die there, you can see. So that's another thing that can go wrong. And then tearing. Now, this is what happens when you put so much tensile deformation in that you start to form a neck as it goes round the profile between the annulus, between the die and the punch, and the bottom of the punch itself. You remember that diagram I showed you earlier had incipient necks as it went round that the corner of the punch, because that's where the tensile deformation is biggest. So that's where you will potentially have got to a strain that's sufficient to start to form a neck in tensile loading. And effectively, if you start to form a neck, you localize strain and then additional plastic strain that goes in, goes in there, not anywhere else, because it's easier for it to go in there. And you do that, you just push the end of your component off. So that's tearing. Similar to necking in a tensile test, it's an instability that occurs when the tensile strains are too large for your material. And we'll come back to how to solve that in the next lecture. Now, it may well be that this is the last slide in this lecture. Oh, there's a summary. OK, so deep drawing is very widely used. Uh, basically, if you want to make a 3D component out of sheet metal, then deep drawing is your go to process, um, particularly if you want to make lots of them and you want to actually push it quite a long way away from being sheet. Stamping might be better for you um, if you're actually making a component with only a few little ripples in it. So the tooling for deep drawing has to be specially designed for each new component. So it's suited to mass production. So if you're doing drinks cans by the million, you deep draw them in a very expensive facility. If you are making a component out of a piece of sheet as a one-off, maybe you get a blacksmith to do it for you um, because you don't want to build on design and build the tooling for deep drawing to just make one. Think of something else if you're making it in that way. It's a fairly simple process with regard to the tooling and the tooling movements. You know, you basically got something which goes down and comes up again. Um, it doesn't look quite as complex as an extrusion mill, for instance. Um, now you do get product defects. Uh, we mentioned, um, three, didn't we, today? We mentioned earring, we mentioned tearing, and we mentioned wrinkling. Um, so it does require careful control. We'll come back to how to control some of those in the next lecture. And that is all I have to say today. So that's where we've got to on deep drawing.
Um, tomorrow, Anastasia will carry this on and we'll look at actually performing some calculations on estimating how to deep draw components of certain forms. Um, okay, we've got, oh, we've run on again. Sorry, I'm talking too slowly. We've got time for a few questions. Uh, has anybody got any questions? Please put your hand up if you've got questions and I'll try to answer them. If you have no questions, we can reconvene tomorrow. I'll be attending tomorrow's lecture. Uh, Anastasia is going to be delivering it. Um, and um, we can answer questions on both this lecture and tomorrow's lecture then. And of course, we can also do that at the drop-in session on Wednesday, because it may well be that once we've done the calculations, you then look back at what we said today and think, I still don't understand that. Okay, so if we have no questions, I'll stop the recording and I will see you all tomorrow at four o'clock when Anastasia will continue the story of deep drawing. Okay, thank you. <laughs>